Welcome to another tutorial video. This time around, we're going to be going through some common interview questions that you might get related to merger models and accretion dilution analysis. So a typical question we get on this topic is, I'm preparing for interviews right now. How should I study for the technical questions? And what should I expect if I haven't had much finance experience? Will I get detailed M&A and LBO related questions? So the short answer here is that bankers tend to test you up to your point of failure. So yes, M&A and LBO related questions could easily come up even if you haven't had a finance internship or classes or other previous experience. However, within those topics, the trend in interviews over the past few years has been that interviewers like to ask more difficult questions on the fundamentals rather than going into more obscure topics. So an advanced question in interviews related to M&A deals, for example, might be something tricky about how you calculate EPS accretion dilution instead of the esoteric details of the tax treatment in a certain type of deal or how taxes differ in a 338H10 deal, for example, or something like that. So you really need to understand the fundamentals and to get a lot of practice with answering questions on basic earnings per share calculations, how equity value and enterprise value change, how valuation multiples change, and other things like that. The other trend in interviews is that bankers like to ask you a progression of questions on the same topic to see how much you really know. So they might give you a simple scenario at first, and then they'll start adding more complexity to it over time. So it's somewhat less common these days to jump around and to go from topic A to topic B to topic C. More often, they will pick one topic and then drill down and see how much you really know on it. So a typical progression for merger models and M&A deals might be the following. First, they'll start off by asking you a very simple question to test whether you know the basic rules for accretion dilution and how to predict it. Then they may ask you to walk through the full model using real numbers that they provide. Then they'll ask you a somewhat more advanced and less common topic, which is how equity value and enterprise value and the valuation multiples change with different purchase methods and with different deal terms. Then they'll get into some more difficult questions, not about what actually happens, but what might happen if some of the parameters here changed. For example, what range would you expect for the combined multiples in an M&A deal under different scenarios and conditions? And then what would happen if the buyer were twice as big as the size that they gave you previously in the sequence of questions? And what's the intuition behind that? Why would accretion dilution change in certain ways depending on the size of the buyer and seller? So we're gonna go through all these questions using a combination of slides as well as this Excel file that I have. You can download it below the video by clicking on show more on YouTube and scrolling to the bottom and getting the files there. We're gonna be using this extensively along with these slides for the intuition and the explanations. Let's get started with the basic question first on the rules of accretion dilution. A company with a PE multiple of 25X acquires another company for a purchase PE multiple of 15X. Will the deal be accretive or dilutive? Believe it or not, this question is actually not so straightforward to answer because the answer is that you can't tell unless it is a 100% stock deal. You will see online in a lot of places that if a company with a higher PE multiple acquires a company with a lower PE multiple, then it's accretive, but that's not quite true. It's only accretive if it's an all stock deal and you ignore everything else beyond the effects of additional shares, foregone interest on cash and interest paid on new debt. Now, the reason it's accretive if it's a 100% stock deal is the following. The cost of the acquisition here is the reciprocal of the buyer's PE multiple. So one over 25 is 4%, but then the seller's PE multiple is 15X. The seller's yield is therefore one over 15, which is 6.7%. Since the seller's yield is above the cost of acquisition, the deal will be accretive. The way to think about it, put simply, is that the buyer is getting something with its stock right now, but then if it trades that stock for the seller instead, it's going to get more for its stock, 6.7% instead of the old 4% number. We have this exact scenario set up in Excel where one company has a PE multiple of 25X. The other company has a PE multiple of 10X, but the buyer pays a 50% premium. So the purchase PE multiple is 15X. And you can see how this works. We can calculate the weighted 
average acquisition cost, which in this case is just the 4% because we're using 100% stock. We compare it to the seller's yield. And if this weighted average acquisition cost is lower, then the deal should be accretive. So that's a fairly simple question. Next, they might give you some real numbers and ask you to walk through what happens with these real numbers. So let's say it is a 100% stock deal. The buyer has 10 shares outstanding, a share price of $25, and it has net income of 10. So an equity value of 250, net income of 10 for a P multiple of 25. It acquires the seller for a purchase equity value of 150. The seller has net income of 10. So again, the PE multiple here is 15. We can assume the same tax rates. How accretive is this deal? So not just is it accretive or dilutive, but how accretive is it? What are the numbers and what are the percentages? Again, we have this whole scenario laid out in Excel, but I think it's a bit simpler to look at the basic idea first before jumping into Excel. First off, you have to look at the buyer's standalone earnings per share. So it has 10 in net income, which is coming from the instructions right here, and then it has 10 shares outstanding. So 10 in net income divided by 10 shares outstanding means they have an earnings per share of $1 per share. Now to do this deal, it's a 100% stock deal. The buyer will have to issue six new shares to do it because each of its shares is worth $25. And we know that they're paying 150 for the seller because that's the purchase equity value. 150 divided by 25 is six. The seller shares go away and the exact share count of the seller doesn't matter at all. The combined share count after the fact will just be the buyer's old share count plus the new shares issued in the deal, 10 plus six, which equals 16. And then to get the combined earnings per share, we need to figure out the combined net income. Now, in this case, it's pretty simple because the tax rates are the same for both companies and the buyer has net income of 10, the seller has net income of 10, so we can just add those together. So the combined net income is 10 plus 10 or 20. No cash or debt was used, so there's no difference in interest or interest income, interest expense, or anything like that. So we can just add these together because of that fact and because the tax rates were the same. So the combined earnings per share is 20 over 16, which is $1.25, which means there's 25% accretion here. If you want to look at it in Excel, we do the math in a more flexible way there because we don't assume that the buyer and seller have the same tax rates, but the basic idea is pretty similar, namely that if they're paying 150 for the seller using 100% stock and they have a share price of 25, they're going to issue six in new shares. The combined net income, we can just add together the net income of the buyer and seller because the tax rates are the same and there's no difference in interest after the fact. And then, of course, that gets us to our combined EPS, just the 20 here divided by the 16 shares. Let's move on and go into the third category of questions on equity value and enterprise value. So the banker might now turn to you and say, okay, let's continue with the same deal. What are the combined equity value and combined enterprise value in this deal? And we can assume that the equity value equals the enterprise value for both the buyer and the seller here, just to simplify things a bit. We have that scenario shown up here where we get the equity value of the buyer and seller, but each of them have the exact same amount of cash and debt, so they offset each other. And as a result, equity value equals enterprise value for both the buyer and the seller. The rule here is very simple, which is that the combined equity value equals the buyer's equity value plus the value of any stock issued in the deal. In other words, the seller's equity value goes away completely. It doesn't exist independently anymore. So it's just the buyer's equity value plus any stock used to fund the deal. So here it's pretty simple. It's just 250 plus 150, which gives us 400. For the enterprise value, the combined enterprise value equals the buyer's enterprise value plus the purchase enterprise value of the seller. So once again, it's just 250 plus 150 giving us 400. And you can see the math done here as well, but we're really just taking the buyer's current enterprise value. We're adding the purchase enterprise value and that gives us the combined number. And then for the combined equity value, you can see that one of the differences here is that we do start with the buyer's current metric, but then the combined value depends on how much stock was used. So if we were to change this and we made this a 100% debt deal instead, 
Now our combined equity value would be a lot lower. Our combined enterprise value would be the same, but the combined equity value would be, would be lower because now we haven't issued any stock to do this deal. If you get that right, then the banker might follow up and ask something like this. How do the enterprise value to EBITDA and PE multiples change if the purchase method changes? So let's say we didn't have 100% stock here. Let's say we had 100% debt or 100% cash instead. What would happen in this case? I'm going to go into Excel for this part and show you. So we have our combined multiples down here. And I'm cheating a little bit here because I'm making an assumption for each company's EBITDA. We weren't given this in the instructions, but I just want to show you how this works. We have our combined multiples. And the important point to note is that if we had, say, a 100% debt deal instead, the combined enterprise value to EBITDA multiple would not change at all. If we change it to 100% cash deal, the enterprise value to EBITDA multiple would also not change. However, the PE multiple in this case would change and it would change pretty significantly. And that's the basic rule for this. Enterprise value is supposed to represent all the investors in the company. And so in M&A scenarios, the purchase method, cash, debt, or stock, or some mix of all of those will not affect the combined enterprise value and it won't affect the combined EBITDA, but it will affect the combined equity value, the combined net income, and therefore the combined PE multiple. So here's what we might say. We couldn't say exactly how the combined EBITDA and therefore the combined enterprise value to EBITDA multiple would change because we don't have the information in this original question, but we can say that it won't be affected by the purchase method. With the PE multiple, we do know the combined equity value and the combined net income. So we can just take 400, divide by 20 and get 20 X for the multiple. The PE multiple is affected by the purchase method because the combined equity value depends on the amount of stock issued. The combined net income is going to be affected by the cash and debt used because the interest is going to be different depending on the cash and the debt that the buyer uses. So that's the third category of questions here. Now, at this point, if you get all these questions right, now the banker might start moving into more hypothetical territory. And he or she might say something like this. Without doing any math, what ranges would you expect for the combined enterprise value to EBITDA and PE multiples and why? And this one is actually pretty simple to answer, but it's maybe a little bit harder to justify. If you have something like our scenario here and you look at the combined multiples, 8.3, 8.9 and 20, they are exactly between the buyer's multiples and then the seller's multiples at this purchase price. So the PE multiple of 20 is exactly in between the PE multiples of 15 and 20. And then the others are not quite exactly in between, but they are somewhere in this range of 6.8 to 9.6 and then 7.1 to 10.4. The basic intuition is that you're adding together both companies' enterprise values and EBITDAs or EBITs or whatever. And so you would expect these multiples to reflect that and to be somewhere in the middle of that range. And with the PE multiple, it's a similar idea. You're not exactly adding together both companies' net incomes, but if they have relatively similar tax rates and there's no cash or debt used, that's a reasonable assumption. If it's all stock, you're taking the equity value of one company and then adding it to the other one. So you'd expect these multiples to end up somewhere in the middle of the range. Here, again, as I said, we do get a PE multiple that's exactly in the middle, but it's not always going to happen like that. In fact, it'll almost never happen like that because it depends on the sizes of the buyer and seller. So with this question, it's not as simple as just taking an average of the multiples and using that to decide. In reality, the combined multiples are usually going to be more toward the buyer if the buyer is quite a bit bigger and then more toward the seller if the seller is quite a bit bigger. And if they're about the same, the multiples will probably be somewhere roughly in the middle of this range. And then the last question here, what happens if the buyer is twice as big? So it has an equity value of 500 and then a net income of 20. And when they say what happens, what they really mean is what happens to the combined multiples and then what happens to the accretion dilution. Let's plug in those numbers and see what actually happens. So let's say that the company has 20 shares outstanding and then it has an operating income of 48, a net interest expense of negative eight. I'm just doubling all these numbers. So it has a net income of 20, equity value of 500. Its PE multiple is still the same. And 
you can see what happens here. All the multiples are closer to the buyer's multiples. The accretion dilution is lower, and the intuition is simply that the buyer has a greater weighting now, so it makes sense that the multiples will move closer to the buyer's standalone multiples. The accretion is lower because if you think about it, in this deal, the seller is making the deal accretive because its yield is higher than the buyer's yield. So when the seller has less of a weighting and the buyer has more of a weighting and the buyer is making the deal less accretive, then the deal as a whole is going to be less accretive when the buyer gets bigger. And that's the basic intuition here. If you think about the math, the buyer was previously 250 out of 400 of the total company, but now it's only 500 out of 650, which in the first case is roughly 63, 62%, something like that. And then the second case is around 75 or 76%. So there's about a 10 to 15% difference. We'd expect the accretion to fall by about 10 to 15%, which is exactly what happens in this case. It used to be 25% accretive, and now it's only 15.4% accretive. So that's some of the intuition behind how you can think about this. And then, as I said, the combined multiples will all move closer to the buyer's multiples because of its greater weighting now. Let's do a recap and summary since we covered quite a bit here. The most important point with all these questions is to avoid memorizing specific questions and answers. You want to learn the principles. Those principles will let you answer anything. Focus on those rather than memorizing everything and just use these types of questions to practice and test yourself. The first principle is that if the seller's yield is above the weighted cost of acquisition, the deal will be accretive. If it is not, if it's below that, it'll be dilutive. And if it's the same, the deal will be neutral to the earnings per share of the buyer. The second principle is that the combined equity value equals the buyer's equity value plus the value of stock issued in the deal. So if there's no stock issued, it's just the buyer's equity value. If it's a 100% stock deal, then it's the buyer's equity value plus the purchase equity value of the seller. Third principle is that the combined enterprise value equals the buyer's enterprise value plus the purchase enterprise value of the seller. The purchase mix, cash, stock, and debt doesn't affect that at all. And then the fourth principle is that the combined PE multiple is affected by that cash, debt, and stock mix, but the combined enterprise value to EBITDA or enterprise value to EBIT multiples are not because enterprise value reflects all the investors in the company. EBITDA is available to all the investors in the company, so this multiple should not be affected by that mix. And then finally, the combined multiples will be somewhere in between the buyer's standalone multiples and the seller's purchase multiples. The exact numbers depend on the relative sizes of the buyer and seller, and then for the PE multiple also on the purchase method, but that is the rule of thumb here and some of the intuition behind it. So this gives you an idea of what to expect in interviews. You don't need to know every single last detail here, but this is a realistic progression of questions you might get related to M&A deals and accretion dilution analysis.